Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to be going over lab 34223. Two, two, that is going to be the appendicular skeleton. Just a reminder, we're not going to be going over every single term in this section. We're going to be leaving some for you to discover on your own with your TA, DA, maybe some classmates, or through the other supplementary information that we have for you on web campus. Starting for today, we're going to start with the scapula. We're going to skip the clavicle. It's a pretty easy structure that is not incredibly hard for you guys to figure out. There's only a couple terms there. Starting off, we have the body of the scapula. That's just this flat part. It's what is like the, kind of looks like a shark tooth. We have the superior, medial, and lateral borders. <clears throat> these are usually tested as regions, and you have to add of scapula to each of these. This is going to be the superior border, <clears throat> the lateral border, and the medial border. Right here we have this giant structure called the scapular spine. We have the glenoid cavity. Coming off of the glenoid cavity is going to be the coracoid process of your scapula. And then this other bigger structure that comes up off of the scapular spine, that's going to be your acromion. You guys can remember from your previous section, we have a couple fossas. Fossas are going to be tested as depressions. You have a subscapular fossa. That's going to be on the inside or on the anterior end of the scapula. On the other side, just above and below the scapular spine, we have a couple more fossas. First of which is the infraspinous fossa below it, and then the supraspinous fossa just above it. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Infra is inferior, or that means below. Supra, superior, that means above. Spinous, think like the scapular spine, and then fossa, a depression. So hopefully it makes sense if we point to this and say name this depression, it's above the scapular spine, it's gonna be the supraspinous fossa. Next up we have the humerus. This is your arm bone. We're gonna start on the proximal end right here. We have the head of the humerus. It's this part that kind of comes to a ball. On the lateral side, we have the greater tubercle of the humerus. You can kind of see it right there. And then on the anterior end, we have the lesser tubercle of the humerus. <clears throat> we have the neck of the humerus. And we actually have two of those. So we have the anatomical neck that comes around the head of the humerus specifically. The surgical neck, is just this neck that comes around the entire proximal end. So what I have my thumb and forefinger around right now. So anatomical neck just around the head of the humerus, surgical neck around the entire thing. And then on the anterior end, we have the deltoid tuberosity. It's this rough bumpy patch right here. It's kind of more on the lateral side, but still on the anterior end. Coming down to the distal end, we have a few structures that you guys are going to need to know, first of which is a couple of the epicondyles. You have a medial epicondyle of your humerus, and then you have a lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Be really careful, this big ball-looking structure right here is not the lateral epicondyle. That is going to be the capitulum. So it's just next to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus right there. This is the capitulum. Then we have the trochlea of the humerus. Next to trochlea, I would write spool of thread. When you guys are in lab, that'll help you uh, identify it really easily. Trochlea of humerus is that spool of thread. We have the alacranon fossa. For that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the humerus and we're gonna look on the posterior end. Again, a fossa is a depression, so that's gonna be that depression in there. Then we have the coronoid fossa. That's the fossa just above the trochlea of the humerus, and then the radial fossa is this little depression just above the capitulum. You can see right there. All right, that's it for the humerus. Next we're gonna get into the radius and the ulna, and we're gonna talk about these two together. So hopefully it makes a little more sense. This is almost always most missed on every practical, is identifying left versus right or radius and ulnas, and then talking about their notches. So starting off, we're gonna start with the ulna. That's this bone, it kind of looks like a wrench, if you can imagine, like you would like use this to like twist something. <clears throat> we have the trochlear notch, that's this giant notch going through here. This is what would hook into <clears throat> the trochlea of the humerus. So you can test that out in lab for yourself. 
you have the alacronon, that's the top part of the wrench right here, and then you have the coronoi process of the ulna. You have a radial notch, so what that looks like is this little divot right here <clears throat> where the radius is going to sit in. So the head of the radius is going to sit inside the radial notch, but the radial notch is in the ulna. So don't get that twisted. That almost always messes people up for this practical. The radial notch is in the ulna. Coming down to the distal end of the ulna, we have a styloid process of ulna. Again, a styloid process is usually where something comes to a point. We ask that you specify of ulna because you guys have already learned other styloid processes. And then this entire thing is just going to be the head of the ulna on the distal end. You'll have to identify left versus right, and your TA can help you with that. Now we're going to move into the radius. We have the head of the radius up top, which is the flat disc-like portion. We have the neck of the radius just underneath the head, so it's what I have my thumb and forefinger wrapped around right now. We have the radial tuberosity. It's this bumpy patch right here just underneath the neck. Coming down to this end, we have a styloid process of your radius. You can see that point right there. It's going to be the styloid process. And then on the other end, there's going to be a little notch. That's going to be the ulnar notch. That's where the head of the ulna is going to sit. So the ulnar notch is in the radius, and again, the radial notch is in the ulna. So spend some time working on those in lab. It definitely confuses a lot of students on this quiz and practical, so make sure you take a look at those for a while. Next, we're going to talk about the carpal bones. <clears throat> you guys are going to probably learn mnemonics in lab that are going to help you out with this, and I would really recommend you become super familiar with them because they're going to help out a lot. So <clears throat> this is a right hand, and I have it in my right hand. So you can see we're going to go in like a counterclockwise fashion. Starting off right here, we have the scaphoid. Coming more medial, we have the lunate, the triquetrium, and then the pisiform. Next, <clears throat> we have the hamate, the capitate, the trapezoid, and the trapezium. So the mnemonic we usually teach you guys is so long to pinky, here comes the thumb. So starting with the scaphoid, we go so, scaphoid, long, lunate, to, triquetrium, pisiform, pinky, and then here comes the thumb, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. Definitely something you guys should take a look at in lab for yourself. Uh, it's very, very confusing, especially probably on this video. There's other uh, supplemental information on web campus like the PowerPoints that'll probably help you navigate this a little easier, but definitely spend some time looking at this. Confuses a lot of students almost every semester. So that is going to be the top part of the appendicular skeleton, and now we're going to get into the lower part, starting with the hip. <clears throat> we have three separate regions in the hip that you guys need to know. The ilium is this giant part that comes to a fan. The pubis is the more superior portion, and then the ischium down here. So those are just kind of like broad, generic regions that you guys need to know. We're going to start with the ilium, starting with the iliac crest. That's this crest going along the superior portion of the ilium. We have several spines you need to know. This is going to be the anterior end. So this is going to be the anterior superior iliac spine. This will be the anterior inferior iliac spine. Coming back here, we're going to have the posterior superior iliac spine and then the posterior inferior iliac spine just there. Then we have a couple notches. <clears throat> we have the greater sciatic notch right here. That's what I'm running the pointer through. And then down here, we're going to have the lesser sciatic notch. That's going to be part of the ischium. We'll go over that in a second. <clears throat> the next term is kind of a little hard to imagine. Um, looking at the PowerPoints along with this video will help a lot. Imagine for a second you're drawing an imaginary line right here along where all this bumpy stuff is. This is going to be the arcuate line running along the course of the ilium. 
And then this depression all on the inside here is going to be the iliac fossa. Next, we're going to come down to the ischium. We have the ischial spine. That's this spine-like structure right here. It's in between the greater sciatic notch and the lesser sciatic notch, so that will kind of help you pinpoint those. <clears throat> we have the ischial tuberosity. It's this rough part by the lesser sciatic notch. And then we have the ischial ramus. It's this part that kind of starts at the bottom of the ischium and dives up that will eventually connect with the pubis. A couple other terms that you guys need to know for the pubis is going to be the superior ramus of the pubis and inferior ramus of the pubis. I usually test it as superior ramus of the pubis is right here and inferior is right there. We have another line we're going to ask that you guys are able to trace. It's going to be the pectineal line. So if you can imagine drawing a line going across the anterior end of the pubis, that would be the pectineal line. We have the acetabulum. It's going to be this divot where the head of the femur is going to sit. So yeah, that's going to be it for the hip. Now we're going to move on to the femur. It's the giant <clears throat> bone in your thigh. And we're going to start on the proximal end. Starting off with the femur, we have the femoral head this giant part that's gonna sit in the acetabulum of your pelvis. We have the neck of the femur just underneath it. It's what my thumb and forefinger are currently going around. We have the fovea capitis. It's this little indent in the femoral head. <clears throat> we have the greater trochanter. It's this lateral bump and then the lesser trochanter. It's more medial but also slightly posterior right here. And then the linea aspera, for that, you're gonna take the femur, you're gonna look at the posterior end, and you're gonna find that crest right there. That's gonna be the linea aspera. Coming down to the distal end, we have a couple different sets of structures that you guys are gonna to need to know, first of which is epicondyles. You have the medial epicondyle right here where my thumb is, and the lateral epicondyle right here where my forefinger is. Medial is gonna be on the same side as the femoral head, so if that helps you out, make sure you notate that. For the condyles, we're going to flip it around. We have our medial condyle right here and our lateral condyle right here. We have an intercondylar fossa. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. We're going to test this as a depression. A depression is a fossa. It's in between those two condyles, so it's the intercondylar fossa. And then flip it back around to the anterior side, this little indent we have right here is going to be the patellar surface. That's going to be where your patella sits. Moving on, we're going to go over the tibia. Starting on the proximal end, we have medial and lateral condyles of your tibia. So medial is right here where my thumb is, lateral is where my forefinger is. You have your intercondylar eminence. That's right here. It's this structure on top, which is in between the two condyles. You have your tibial tuberosity. It's this bump right here on the front. If you feel your shin or your tibia, you can almost feel it just below your knee. It's a little bumpy patch right there. Along the anterior side is gonna be the anterior margin. If you feel your tibia, you can feel almost to where it comes to a point running up and down the leg. That's gonna be the anterior margin. And then down here on the distal end, we have the medial malleolus. It's this big bump right here where my thumb is. If you feel the inside of your ankle bone, <clears throat> where there's that giant bump that sticks out just above your sock line, that's going to be your medial malleolus. And then on the outside part, it's going to be the lateral malleolus of the fibula. Next, we're going to go over some stuff with the foot. Specifically, we're going to talk about the tarsal bones. Starting off, we have the medial cuneiform the intermediate cuneiform, the lateral cuneiform, the cuboid, the calcaneus is this big one back here. It comes all the way back. We have the navicular right here, and then the talus. So, 
medial cuneiform, intermediate cuneiform, lateral cuneiform, cuboid, calcaneus, talus, navicular. The mnemonic I usually teach my students for this is you start at the medial cuneiform and you loop around and it goes, man, I love cooking chicken teriyaki noodles. So if that helps you out, that might <clears throat> be useful to write down in your notebook, man, I love cooking chicken teriyaki noodles. You can also come up with your own. That's definitely totally acceptable, whatever works best for you guys. Now we're going to jump into some conversation about some of the joints, starting with the shoulder joint. What's nice about the shoulder joint is there's only three terms, and the terms almost kind of describe where they are. So for example, the coracoacromial ligament. If you know where the acromion is on the scapula, and if you know where the coracoid process is, you'll know that this ligament right here is going to be the coracoacromial ligament. Next, we have the coracoclavicular ligament. So we're going to find the coracoid process of the scapula and the clavicle, and it's going to be that ligament that connects those two. And then the acromioclavicular ligament is going to be this big one right here. It connects the clavicle to the acromion. So acromioclavicular ligament. Next up, we have the elbow joint. Only three you need to know here as well. Next to the collateral ligaments, right vertical striations annular ligament of the ulna is going to be horizontal striations. So find the radius, find the vertical striations, and you'll see that that's going to be the radial collateral ligament. On the other side, you can find the ulna. The vertical striations there are going to be the ulnar collateral ligament. And then this little strip right here is going to be the annular ligament that goes across the radius. Next up for the hip joint, we're going to talk about a couple of them. <clears throat> What's nice is if you know the regions of the hip, you should be able to find the ligaments relatively easily. So for example, this is the ilium up here and it's connecting to the femur, so this is going to be the iliofemoral ligament. Over here, this is the pubis. So, and it connects to the femur, so this one's going to be the pubofemoral ligament. And then down here towards the ischium, which you kind of have to look from a weird angle to find, that connects to the ischium, to, from, from the ischium to the femur is going to be the ischiofemoral ligament. And the last one we're going to talk about is the knee joint. Most of you probably have a lot of exposure to this already, just, you know, like... Uh, lots of people get in skiing, snowboarding accidents up here, so people often will say like, oh, I tore my ACL or I tore my MCL. Just know that in your lab, in quizzes and practicals, you cannot say MCL, LCL, ACL, all that stuff. You have to write out the entire name. So starting off, we're going to talk about the menisci. On the medial end, we're going to have the medial meniscus, and then on the lateral side, we're going to have the lateral meniscus. <coughs> Just above the patella, this is going to be the quadriceps tendon, and then just below, this is going to be the patellar ligament. The patellar ligament is what doctors usually uh, hit with their little uh, tool in the doctor's office to make your knee kick out, cause the knee jerk reflex. It's kind of a cool little fun fact. Next up, we have the ACL. You, what you do is you take the quadriceps tendon, you pull it down, you pull this back, and that ligament right there is going to be the ACL. The PCL, you're going to flip it around and look for back, and this is going to be the PCL right here. And then for the LCL and MCL, we have the tibial or medial collateral ligament right here, connects to the tibia. And then we have the fibular or lateral collateral ligament right here. Be really careful with these terms. I've had many students say tibial cruciate ligament instead of tibial collateral ligament. It's anterior and posterior cruciate ligament, and then it's medial or lateral collateral ligaments. So make sure you guys don't get that confused. Um, yeah, that's all we're going to go over for today. Good luck in lab this week, guys. <clears throat> make sure you go over any terms we did not go over with your TA, DA, or your lab mates, and good luck on your quizzes and your upcoming practical.